I have been reading a book called Remember, The Science of Memory and the Art of Forgetting by Lisa Genova. The book is uh, in the genre of nonfiction, popular science, popularized cognitive neuroscience of memory. So the topic is memory. And I picked this book because I thought it would be a good idea to read and review it for my channel. But the effect, the, the emotional effect that this kind of book has on me is, is very negative. And uh, out of the three parts of the book, the book is divided into three main parts. Each part is divided into chapters. And today I read the first uh, of the three parts. And I would like to continue and get to the end of the book, but it seems very difficult emotionally. And um, before I review, before I publish a review of the book in the next few days, I thought maybe I could share with you some general reflections about what bothers me about the style of these kinds of books, these popular psychology books. The tone that uh, the authors and uh, Dr. Genova, Professor Genova, is not an exception. She's not a unique case in adopting this style. The attitude that they have with, uh, in relation to the reader um, they regard, they seem to regard the reader uh, in a very uh, non-flattering, sorry about my cat, <laughs> in a very unflattering light. They regard the, the reader as very superficial, very inattentive, um, very silly and goofy. And they basically, they seem to be, they want to appeal to what is most inane, what is uh, most superficial in the reader. Uh, so let me just give you a sample. Here is a, in this part, in this passage, the author, Dr. Genova, is talking about uh, what, is, what it is that makes a memory strong, what it is that makes an event, an episode, memorable. So when something is routine, just ordinary, repeat it regularly, every day you do the same thing, you take the same route, coming back from work towards home, or you have the same dinner every night, that's not memorable. Uh, because it doesn't stand out. And he's talking about, let's say, uh, you have a husband, and your husband comes home in the same car, parks in the same driveway, same location, every day, and he comes home alone, and that's there's nothing unusual about that. And she writes, now let's imagine that, uh, I'm quoting, uh, quote, now let's imagine that he pulls into the driveway tonight at 5 o'clock in a red Ferrari, dressed in drag, and George Clooney is in the passenger seat. Whoa, that's never happened before. Everything about this event is astonishing. The surprise factor alone is enough to kick this particular ev evening into a memorable for life category. <laughs> but you also probably tell everyone you know, relaying the story over and over. OMG, he pulled into the driveway and you won't believe it. And with every retelling, you are reactivating the memory, reinforcing the neural pathways that encode the details of what you experience, making the memory stronger. Um, but, next paragraph, but if your husband then continues to come home every night at five in the red Ferrari dressed in drag and his pal George Clooney, well, even George gets to be old news. I know, hard to imagine, end quote. So it's, um, it's a good, this, adopting this kind of writing tone is probably a good marketing strategy. It is engaging. She appeals to a certain um, category of readers. Um, she, she wants to be relatable. And, I, you know, I'm, I don't have anything against, in my judgment, there's nothing bad inherently about being silly, about talking about the silly side of ordinary life, everyday life. And I regularly talk with my dear sister and my sister and I, we have a very wide range of conversation types, and my wife and I are the same. We have a wide range of conversation types of conversation that we have, ranging from extremely silly and goofy to extremely serious. And that range is very important. You know, when, we, when I talk uh, with a friend or a family member, and when we are being goofy together and we are laughing together, then we won't introduce in that type of conversation. We, don't, we, won't, we will not bring into that conversation, that, into that goofy conversation, into that inane, superficial conversation, topics related to science, or religion, or philosophy. 
And if we bring in that conversation, we will switch to a slightly more serious form because then the, the format of the form of the style of conversation, which is the medium of, for the topic, will become appropriate to the topic at hand. Everyday life, uh, the, the, the domain of everyday experience is, um, is also rich in that way. It, is, it has a wide variety of, a wide range of styles from very goofy, very unserious to very serious. What Dr. Genova, the author of this book, what she's doing is that she is insisting, um, she's insistently appealing to the non-serious aspect of everyday experience. And for me, that is the flaw. That is what pushes me into this dismay, the mood of dismay, this, this disheartenedness. <laughs> it, I feel very discouraged when I see uh, scientists adopting this strategy and when I see it working, being effective as a marketing strategy, as a way of introducing science, uh, as you know, exclusively fun, fun-loving uh, and goofy. Because they are trying to be in dialogue with the reader and they're trying to be in dialogue. They, they want to, they're guiding the reader's attention, guiding the reader's attention towards the aspects of their day-to-day -day life. But that dialogue is not wide ranging enough. It is exclusively narrowly focused on the, the most silly, most superficial, most goofy side of everyday experience. Now, I happen to believe this is a controversial, a relatively controversial idea, but I happen to believe that this is not just about the relationship between the pop scientist and the readers, the general reader, the, the lay reader like us. This relationship between the, the most silly and most goofy aspect of everyday life is saying something about the private mind and the private consciousness of the pop scientists. When pop scientists are among themselves and thinking by themselves without having to discuss and talk and present to the general reader, even then, I think, it is most effective to present their science, to stage their science, to, to put it against the background of that silly, fun-loving, superficial, um, impatient, inattentive aspect of every, everyday life. Because if they bring in the serious side of everyday life, if they bring in the, the side of everyday life that is reflective, that is careful, that is critical, that is, an, that is a genuine aspect of everyday life, everyday consciousness. Every person, every lay reader, every lay person, a common person, most of us are capable of patiently, carefully, and critically pay attention in a way that is relatively more skeptical about what we are listening to. And when somebody is telling us, for example, that, oh, let me tell you what makes something more memorable. A common reader who is serious, they can let the language speak to them. I can just pause and let the language, the language speaks to us, the language. What does it mean when we call something memorable? The meaning of memorable, that this concept carries, it is charged with implications. It's charged with meaning. Something is memorable when it is out of the ordinary, when it is not routine. The meaning of the word memorable already implies these things that the neuroscientists want to teach us. They say that they, their claim is that it is the neuroscience, the cognitive neurosciences of memory that tells us what the meaning of the word memorable is. It is exceptional, that is emotionally charged. No, language, common sense already has given us the meaning of the concept memorable. We already know, we already know that uh, an implication of calling something memorable is that it is probably emotionally charged or it is probably something extraordinary about that episode or, or, or that event. But by bringing the conversation, the level, level of the conversation down to the most goofy and most superficial, it is then that we can be most surprised. It is then that we can generate the most level of surprise and the most level of credibility to these pop scientists. That is why they insist on talking to us at that goofy level, at the level of a superficial, impatient, inane, somebody who has no background in thinking about anything. That's the reason, because in that stage, their science can be presented in its most, under the most flattering light. It is then that the science, their science can be staged 
and justified most effectively, most strongly. Um, so it is that, I think, that is uh, discouraging me, that is giving me this negative feeling. Um, of course, I'm not the most cheerful person, and uh, I, will not, I will not discourage you from reading this book by Professor Genova. It's, uh, it has its strengths. I've been teaching for five, six years a course on cognitive neuroscience and a course in cognitive psychology. And so far, what I've read from this book is consistent with what I read and teach based on the textbooks in cognitive psychology. There's a textbook called the Handbook, Student's Handbook in Cognitive Psychology, which is quite extensive. It has three chapters on, about memory. That's a good textbook. And of course, there are many other good textbooks in, in cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. And what you read um, in a pop, sci pop science book about memory and psychology, it's not that different. Textbooks in psychology are very readable. You can read them, they're, they're very approachable. You don't need, um, in general, you don't need a, a popularized, a popular uh, version of the cognitive psychology. It's not like math and physics or chemistry. Um, science, psychological science, neuroscience uh, has conceptually, has a quite a superficial conceptual structure. You don't need lots of background to, to catch up. All right, so just wanted to share that with you. And uh, in the next video, I will give my review, review of the entire book, Remember, The Science of Memory and the Art of Forgetting by Lisa Genova. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any thoughts, feedback, please let me know. And um, all for now.